or welcome back to my channel. It is Tuesday morning, the morning after the premiere of The Gilded Age Episode 8, Tucked Up in Newport. I watched the episode last night. <sighs> Guys, we've got a lot of notes to cover, so let's just dive right in. We start with George being extremely angry with his legal team extremely frustrated because they don't have I guess you could call it the smoking gun they don't have anything solid to prove his innocence so I think this anger is definitely coming from a place of fear George is terrified that he will not be able to prove he didn't do what this man Dixon is saying he did. More on that later, we see Gladys and Carrie Astor and a couple other young men and ladies practicing their dancing for Gladys's debutante ball. I believe they're specifically practicing the quadrille. Bertha walks in and she says everyone has to leave because her and Gladys have to pack for Newport. Gladys asks her about her dresses and Bertha's like oh it's fine I've taken care of it and Gladys is like oh but I like uh, you didn't need my input like what about this other one like I can you know talk to you about it and then Bertha's like don't worry about it I took care of everything you can see the disappointment on Gladys's face Bertha got all her dresses without any of Gladys's like opinions like her favorite colors or you know what accessories she wants to wear does she want flowers on the dress that kind of thing like there's nothing to make it personal to her because her mom just insists that she do everything and Gladys that doesn't even know what she's getting she didn't even show her at least that made me sad Oscar is headed to Newport with Larry Russell with every intention of going after Gladys. Oscar and Marion have an interaction about it. I didn't realize this. Like, apparently Marion knows Oscar's after Gladys. I guess, you know, he hasn't been very subtle. So then when Oscar walks away to the carriage, Larry comes back and Marion tells him, watch your sister. And Larry laughs it off in jokes because he knows that Oscar's after his sister. So, everyone knows. I don't know if I'm just dumb. I, I didn't realize that, you know, Oscar's cousin Marion, his best friend, I think they're best friends, Larry, like, they know. I don't know. I thought that was interesting. <laughs> I wasn't aware that, you know, everyone was in the know. Agnes is still giving Bannister the cold shoulder. Uh, like, the pettiness. I can't help but love her, though. I do feel for Bannister. I really do. Speaking of Bannister, I'm going to mention this now because I actually forgot to write it down. There's a part in the episode when Bannister walks over to the Russell house and talks to church and oh, I forget what the, oh, what's she called? Like the head maid or whatever. I forget what her name is. He's talking to them and he's inquiring about Turner. By the way, is not in this episode. This is the first episode she's not in, which is interesting. Is she going to be back or is she just gone? Because she sent a letter to Bannister that she wanted to tell him who sent the letter about him being at the Russell's home, right? Well, Bannister is talking to Church and he's implying that Turner doesn't like him very much. And I'm thinking that Turner told him it was Church off screen. He just kind of implies that Turner doesn't like him and she left not liking him. And then Bannister leaves. <laughs> I don't know. Very interesting. But I felt like that was definitely important to 
mention. Okay, back to my notes. Aurora Fane approaches Marion. Remember last week I was talking about Tom Rakes and Miss Bingham at their Edison picnic. I really didn't get the impression that Tom was being overly flirtatious and if that's what he was meant to be doing. It wasn't a convincing performance. Miss <laughs> Bingham, on the other hand, was being very flirtatious, even offering to give him a place to stay should he ever find himself in Newport. Well, Aurora Fane was watching. In this episode, she approaches Marion and tells her, I have my doubts about Tom. And she doesn't even get into detail. She doesn't tell Marion why. She just says, I have doubts. And Marion reassures her that everything's fine. You don't need to worry about him. And she just leaves it at that. But now she has her Aunt Agnes and her cousin? Yeah, her cousin Aurora. Both telling her to be careful. They have concerns about this man. I am scared. Why are they pushing this so freaking hard? We see Tom Rakes stop by the Van Ryan house very quickly and drop off a letter for Peggy. It's all very mysterious, but don't you worry because we find out what the letter is later on. Marion tells Peggy she intends to say yes to Tom's proposal. She's done with caring what her aunts think. She's done with the uncertainty. She wants to be with him. She's going to say yes. Oh my god. Jack from the Van Ryn household, he gets the afternoon off to go somewhere secret and he leaves the house with flowers. Bridget sees him with the flowers and it's obvious that she's jealous. More on that later. Peggy's concerned because Armstrong made some comments implying that Peggy has a secret she's not sharing with everyone. And Peggy thinks she might have read the letter from Tom. Before I knew what was in the letter, I was assuming that this big secret between her and her family was somewhat hinted at in the letter. And that's why it's such a huge deal that it got out. Don't worry, though. We're getting there. We're almost there. George's valet, Watson, is finally caught in the act of spying on that woman who we now know is named Mrs. McNeil. She calls him over and asks why he's been watching her because she's noticed him. He says, you don't recognize me? And obviously she doesn't. And then he tells her his last name. I think I heard it right. Collier? Collier? Yeah, something like that. C-O-L-L-Y-E-R. And all of a sudden, she recognizes and immediately turns and quickly walks back into her house. He calls after her, Flora. He calls her by her first name. So I'm thinking this is not a family member. They must have had a romantic relationship in the past, the way this situation went down. There's nothing more about this in the episode. But now we at least have a little more context to the situation, and I'm sure we'll find out more. Marion goes to Tom Rake's office. They do it. They agree to elope, and they seal the deal with a kiss. And I'll admit, I was all fluttery during this scene, like, <laughs> I hate myself. I really do. It feels like this is it, right? They're getting together. Mm. I really want to be happier. I do. But I just, I sense doom. The Russell's chef, Baudin, hopefully I'm saying that right, Baudin, 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 he is seen arguing with a woman outside the Russell house, a woman that no one else in the staff knows. And, I mean, they're in a really heated argument. The other staff ask him about it, and he refuses to say anything. He actually just gets up and says he's going to bed. So, 
that's another mystery like Watson that we're going to have to find out about because literally no context to the situation. We know nothing at this point. I'll stop right here to let you know Tom Rakes does not go anywhere near Newport in this episode. That's what I feared last week after the whole Miss Bingham thing, but tucked up in Newport has nothing to do with him. Actually, a bunch of other people vacation in Newport in this episode. Bertha, Larry, and Gladys Russell are there. Larry Russell's kind of there on his own because he's with Oscar. They're staying with Mrs. Fish. The other Russells are staying with the McAllisters. That's who invited them. And Aurora Fane is also there. I don't know if her husband is. I don't think he is because they had a dinner and he wasn't there. So I think she's alone. And then the Astors are also coming to Newport, but they don't arrive until the end of the episode. We see Ada and Marion shopping in Bloomingdale's. As Marion's walking up to the counter to ask about something, a customer is walking out and the shopkeeper is calling after you. You forgot your purse. You forgot your purse. Marion's like, oh, I know her. That's George Russell's stenographer. I can give her her purse back. She's like, oh, thank you. She calls her Miss Dixon. So when Marion arrives at the Russell's house and hands the purse to Church and George Russell, who walks up, she calls her Miss Dixon, and they're very confused. And she's like, your stenographer. She doesn't actually know his stenographer. When she and Oscar and Larry were talking before they left for Newport, George's stenographer walked up with some papers that really needed to get to him, and she dropped them off and then walked away, and she asked who that was, and Larry told her. So that's how she recognized her in Bloomingdale's. George and Church, looking very confused, and George is like, you must mean Miss Ainsley. And Mary's like, oh, well... Maybe the shopkeeper was just mistaken or she was using someone else's charge account. Anyways, I recognized her and wanted to drop it off. Her name's Miss Ainsley, but she was using an account under the name Dixon. Interesting. More on that later. The Van Rines cook, Mrs. Bauer, goes to Ada and Marion and warns them that Armstrong is definitely plotting something against Peggy, obviously having to do with that letter. Marion immediately talks to Peggy and, guys, this is the one. This is the big secret. Are you ready for this? I was right. It did have something to do with that guy named Elias Finn. Also, Maybe two weeks ago, someone commented on one of my Gilded Age videos saying there was a theory that Peggy was married and trying to get a divorce. That's actually a close theory. Basically, this Elias Finn did not leave her life. Her parents didn't approve of him because he was poor, uneducated, didn't really have any prospects for the future and they wanted more for their daughter. She ran away with him, and by the time her parents found her, they were already married, and Peggy was pregnant. She gave birth to a baby boy and almost died in childbirth, so she was very out of it. When she came out of that, her baby boy had died. Her father forced Elias to sign a paper saying he was already married. When he signed that, obviously it makes his marriage to Peggy void. They had a judge sign off on that. So basically the father forced them into an annulment. Peggy has been talking to Tom Rakes because she wanted to find the midwife who delivered her baby. She just wanted to know what he looked like, know more about him, because she was so ill that she missed everything. She never even got to look at him. This scene was heavy, and she's in tears, Marion's in tears. Guys, I really feel like this is the most genuine bonding moment we've seen between the two of them. I didn't cry, but I was close. Moving on. 
Oscar's intimate friend, shall we call him, John Adams, he unexpectedly shows up in Newport and sort of invites himself to Mrs. Fish's dinner later that night. Obviously, she approves. He wouldn't be there if she didn't. Uh, but he just kind of, like, inserts himself in their conversation and, yeah, gets himself invited. Oscar is not happy. I don't know if this is just jealousy because he knows that Oscar is trying to rope Gladys into a marriage. But, yeah, Oscar is very angry. During George Russell's pre-trial, I think that's what you would call it, at the last minute, it seems like his legal team has found their smoking gun. They bring forward his stenographer, Miss Ainsley. Turns out, at Bloomingdale's, she was using someone else's charge account, Mr. Dixon's. As in the Dixon who's been accusing George Russell of orchestrating the use of inexpensive old parts for his trains. She knows him, and... She not only knew about the train thing, she knew that Dixon has been stealing money from George Russell for quite some time. Her testimony gets George exonerated. I think that's the right word. Basically, the judge lets him go. His innocence has been proven. He's free to go. This is great news. However, the George turns to Miss Ainsley and Mr. Dixon and says, you will probably be in my courtroom very soon. George walks up to Miss Ainsley and lets her know that wherever she goes applying for a job, he will be right there. Any job above menial servant, I'm putting that in quotes because that's what he said, any job above menial servant, he will make sure they know of her reputation. She'll never be able to have a job like the one she has now. Ever. George Russell takes grudges to the grave, guys. Like, she almost got him put in prison. And obviously it's not just her. Like, Dixon was behind it. But she's considered an accomplice because she knew and didn't say anything. Now, I don't know how she knows Dixon. I don't know if they're implying that they're dating related. We don't really know the connection. I don't think she said. We just know that she's acquainted enough with him to know that he was stealing money from the Russells. Maybe she benefited from that. We don't know. But yeah, George makes it very clear he's going to make her life hell until the day she dies. <laughs> Jack gets another afternoon off and Bridget follows him. As I suspected, the flowers were for a grave, the grave of his mother, who tragically died in a fire when he was very young. She was visiting her sister, Jack's aunt, and her new baby. A forest fire swept through this town in Wisconsin. Jack said that over 2,000 people died. It might be a real fire. I can't remember what he called the town. Peshtigo, Wisconsin. Yep, it was a real fire. The Peshtigo Fire from October 8th, 1871. It was the same day as the Chicago Fire, which Jack says kind of overshadowed it because this one was in a town in Wisconsin that no one had ever heard of, but over 2,000 victims? They couldn't even find any bodies. That's how bad the fire was. So his mother's coffin is filled with clothes and rocks. And he says that she was the last person that truly loved him because he's not close with his dad. He's not close with his two brothers. Yeah. Another sad scene in this episode, honestly. Now we are at Mrs. Fish's dinner. John Adams openly flirts with Gladys, which pisses Oscar off even more. This is pretty much the last we see of this situation in the episode. I don't know if John Adams is trying to get back at Oscar by trying to win Gladys himself. It's very weird. I feel bad for the girl because she doesn't even realize they're using her for their own personal game at this point. 
Donna Murphy is back as Mrs. Astor. She tells her daughter Carrie that she will not be attending Gladys's debutante ball. She refuses to be in the Russell home, in the Russell ballroom. Bertha Russell comes from nothing. George Russell comes from nothing. Carrie says, that is so mean. And Mrs. Astor looks at her daughter and says, if you want to be a leader, you have to be mean. So because she's the leader of society, she has to be cruel. Like, oh my goodness. We'll see. Bertha is very determined. She seems to have a plan. Encouraged by Marion, Peggy goes to Agnes and tells her the truth. Agnes is very understanding and mentions her own child loss, which Ada seems very shocked that she's talking about it, so it must be something she doesn't talk about often. Armstrong is brought in and scolded and then dismissed. Peggy makes the decision to leave. Marion mentions that it should be Armstrong, not Peggy, but Agnes gives the excuse that she would have to train a new maid. She's old, has her habits. She needs this maid that she's had for years. In the next scene, we see Peggy leaving, and Agnes mentions this. She tells Peggy, I should be letting Armstrong go. I know. I should be letting her go. And Peggy's like, no, I couldn't ask you to do that. It would be too disruptive. I'm very thankful to you for letting me live in this house as long as you did. It's time to move on. It's time for a new chapter. It's okay. They have a very sweet goodbye moment. So sweet, in fact, that this time I did actually cry. Like tears streaming down my face. Agnes really admires Peggy and she tells her, she will not have it easy out in the world, but I think you have what it takes to not let that get to you. Basically telling her, I believe in you, you're gonna make it. I know you will. I just, oh, I loved this scene. Peggy moves back home and we see her with her mother. Yes, Audrey McDonald was also in this episode. She kind of rolls her eyes at Agnes not dismissing Armstrong, but I will say she's not as mean about it as she could be. Her mother is more than happy to have her back home. She believes that Peggy can get out there and do whatever she sets her mind to. However, when Peggy voices that she plans on continuing her work at the New York Globe, her mother is like, mm, your father might not be happy about that. The scene ends and we don't really see anything more. We never see the dad. This could mean more family drama, but somehow I don't think Peggy's gonna let him get to her. Maybe he'll finally come around and see reason. Now we come to the end of the episode. Bertha Russell is insistent that she wants to see the inside of the Astor's Newport home. Apparently, it's like the nicest house around. Mr. McAllister pays off Mrs. Astor's butler to allow him to give Mrs. Russell a private tour. Aurora Fane is also there. They're barely starting the tour when Mrs. Astor arrives early. It's okay that Mr. McAllister and Aurora are there because they're friends with Mrs. Astor, or at least friendly enough that she wouldn't mind them being there. Bertha Russell, on the other hand, cannot under any circumstance be there. So she is ushered out a side entrance and we see Mrs. Astor greeting Mr. McAllister and Aurora. Everyone's being friendly. That's fine. And the episode ends with a very angry Bertha because she's not only led through the side entrance, but she's taken through the servants' quarters and led outside where there's servants beating dusty rugs, plucking chickens. To her, it's an absolute disgrace. And she's mad. <sighs> she is really mad when this episode ends. So we'll see where that leads because I think we've all seen what Birth is capable of when she's angry. That was it for episode eight. Let me know in the comments what you thought. There was a lot in there. There was a lot. A lot to take in. 
If you enjoyed this video, please give it a thumbs up. Don't forget to hit that red button down below to subscribe and to become a member of my YouTube family. Also, click the bell to turn on your notifications. Click the link down below if you'd like to become a patron and financially support future content. There are 10 tiers to choose from, something for every budget. My comments are always open and video suggestions from you are always welcome. I will see you next week. Bye!